Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Suncook Energy First Quarter 2024 Earnings Call. My name is Angela, and I'll be coordinating your call today. During the presentation, you can register to ask a question by pressing star followed by one on your telephone keypad. If you change your mind, please press star followed by two. I will now hand you over to your host, Chantelou Agrial, Vice President of Finance and Treasurer. Please go ahead. Thanks, Angela. Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning to discuss Suncook Energy's first quarter 2024 results. With me today are Mike Rippey, Chief Executive Officer, Catherine Gates, President, and Mark Marinko, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Following management's prepared remarks, we'll open the call for Q&A. This conference call is being webcast live on the investor relations sections of our, section of our website, and a replay will be available later today. If we do not get to your questions on the call today, please feel free to reach out to our investor relations team. Before I turn things over to Catherine, let me remind you that the various remarks you make on today's call regarding future expectations constitute forward-looking statements. The cautionary language regarding forward-looking statements in our SEC filings apply to the remarks we make today. These documents are available on our website as are reconciliations to non-GAAP financial measures discussed on today's call. With that, I'll now turn things over to Catherine. Thanks, Anthony. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on today's call. Before we get started, I'd like to congratulate Mike Rippey on his previously announced retirement in two weeks. Mike's leadership and contributions have been crucial to the success of Suncoke during his tenure. I've had the privilege of working closely with Mike over the past several years and look forward to having him as an advisor for the company. The entire Suncoke team wishes him the best in his retirement. Moving to first quarter results, I wanted to share a few highlights before turning it over to Mark to discuss the results in detail. First, I'd like to thank all of our Suncoke employees for their contributions to our very good first quarter results. Our domestic Coke plants continue to run at full capacity with strong operational performance. Our logistics terminals delivered excellent results, handling 5.5 million tons during the quarter. We saw higher volumes at our domestic terminals, due in part to East Coast port congestion caused by the unfortunate incident in Baltimore, which favorably impacted results. Through our collective efforts, we delivered consolidated adjusted EBITDA of $67.9 million. From a balance sheet perspective, we ended the first quarter with a strong liquidity position of $470.1 million. Our gross leverage was approximately 1.86 times on a trailing 12-month adjusted EBITDA basis at the end of the quarter. Looking ahead, we're pleased to have all of our spot blast and foundry coke sales finalized for the full year. With this strong start, we are well positioned to achieve our full year adjusted EBITDA guidance range of 240 to 255 million dollars. With that, I'll turn it over to Mark to review our first quarter earnings in detail. Mark? Thanks, Catherine. Turning to slide four. Uh, net income attributable Sun Coke was 23 cents per share in the first quarter 2024, up four cents versus the prior year period. Adjusted EBITDA for the first quarter 2024 was $67.9 million compared to $67.1 million in the first quarter 2023. The increase in adjusted EBITDA was primarily driven by higher blast Coke sales volumes and higher volumes at our domestic logistics terminals, partially offset by lower volumes at CMT. Moving to slide five to discuss our domestic Coke business performance in detail. First quarter domestic Coke adjusted EBITDA was $61.4 million and Coke sales volumes were 996,000 tons. The domestic Coke fleet continues to run at full capacity and the increase in adjusted EBITDA as compared to the prior year period was primarily driven by higher blast Coke sales volumes. Our full year domestic Coke sales tons guidance remains approximately 4.1 million tons. As Catherine mentioned earlier, all spot blast and foundry Coke sales are finalized for the full year. Given the strong performance this quarter from our domestic Coke segment, we are well positioned to achieve full year 
domestic coke adjusted EBITDA within our guidance range of 238 to $245 million. Now moving on to slide six to discuss our logistics business. Our logistics business generated $13 million of adjusted EBITDA in the first quarter of 2024, compared to $13.5 million in the first quarter of 2023. The decrease in adjusted EBITDA was primarily due to lower throughput volumes at CMT, partially offset by higher volumes at our domestic terminals. CMT also recognized limited API2 price adjustment benefit during the quarter. Our terminals handled combined throughput volumes of approximately 5.5 million tons during the first quarter of 2024, as compared to 5.3 million tons during the same prior year period. Our domestic terminals handled 3.6 million tons in Q1 2024, making it the best quarter in terms of volume for the domestic terminals in the past five years. The increase in volume was driven in part by the unfortunate bridge incident in Baltimore, which caused East Coast port congestion. We are pleased with the excellent results from our logistics segment in the first quarter and are well positioned to achieve our logistics full year 2024 adjusted EBITDA and volume guidance, which remain unchanged. Now turning to slide seven to discuss our liquidity position for Q1. Suncoke ended the first quarter with a cash balance of $120.1 million. Cash flow from operating activities generated $10 million and was negatively impacted by the timing of working capital changes of approximately $50 million in the quarter. We expect this impact to reverse over the course of the year, and we are reaffirming our full year operating cash flow guidance of 185 to $200 million. We paid $9 million in dividends at the rate of 10 cents per share this quarter and spent $15.5 million on CapEx. In total, we ended the quarter with a strong liquidity position of $470.1 million. With that, I will turn it back over to Catherine. Thanks, Mark. Wrapping up on slide eight. As always, safety is our first priority and we will continue to focus on strong safety and environmental performance. Robust safety and environmental standards set Suncoke apart and are central to our reliable delivery of high quality Coke and logistics services. We remain focused on safely executing against our operating and capital plan for full utilization of our Coke making assets. We also continue to concentrate our efforts on adding new business at our logistics terminals. And while we were able to finalize all of our spot blast and foundry Coke sales for the full year, we are still focused on future opportunities to broaden our customer base. As we've demonstrated in the past, we will pursue a balanced yet opportunistic approach to capital allocation. From a growth perspective, we continue to work on developing the Granite City GPI project. We continuously evaluate the capital needs of the business, our capital structure, and the need to reward our shareholders, and will make capital allocation decisions accordingly. Finally, we're very pleased with the strong results in the first quarter, and we expect to achieve our full year consolidated adjusted EBITDA guidance of 240 to $255 million. With that, let's go ahead and open up the call for Q&A. Thank you, Catherine. Everyone, if you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypad now. If you change your mind, please press star followed by two. We'll pause here briefly as the question is being registered. The first question is from Lucas Pike with B. Riley Securities. Your line is open. Um, Hey, hey, good. Uh, good morning, everyone. How are you? Good morning, Lucas. So um, my, my first question is on, on, on kind of the, the longer term outlook uh, for the utilization rates. Um, what, one of your customers recently commented uh, on, on, a, on, a, on an earnings call about um, 
kind of the Middletown contract and, and, and their desire to um, re replace that blast furnace with a, with a DRI. And um, I saw you, you just renewed uh, a maintenance uh, contract with Floor, so so it seems like you have confidence in the in the in the long term need of 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 your existing coke fleet. But if if you could maybe comment on that and uh, what your outlook is, uh, maybe through first th through the end of this decade and then maybe post uh, 2032, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Lucas. Uh, with respect to, uh, I think you're referring to the uh, the Cliffs announcement um, for their uh, Middletown works. And with respect to that, that announcement really has no impact on us. Um, our contract with Cliffs runs through the end of 2032. Um, you know, in terms of sort of the next decade, if you will, I mean, there's there's a long way to go till 2033. We're not going to speculate on uh, the opportunities that are available to us in 2033 today. Uh, but what we've said before is that we have the newest Coke making assets and we continue to make significant investments in them. We do that because we believe we're best positioned to serve the blast furnaces long term. Got it. And, and, and so when you um, think about the, the, the upcoming uh, more near term uh, renewals, uh, contract renewals. I, I think there's uh, U.S. Steel at the end of this year, then uh, Cleveland Cliffs, uh, I, I think with two contracts next year, and then uh, Algoma I'll, I'll after after that. Um, do you expect more of those tons to shift into either the foundry or, or merchant, uh, or rather spot uh, blast furnace coke market, or, or, or would you expect uh, kind of your, your, your current uh, proportion of contracted to spot volumes to, to stay roughly the same through, through the next two, two three years? Uh, well, with respect to the Granite City Coke contract, as we've said in the past, that Coke contract is part of our GPI project and part of those negotiations. And with respect to our other contracts with other customers, we're always in dialogue with our customers, but we're not going to comment on any kind of contract discussions. Uh, okay, but uh, if if uh, if Middletown were to be a DRI in uh, were to convert to a DRI in 2029, I, I guess Middletown Coke would maybe backfill some of the Haver Hill tons. Uh, so so should we expect that those contract renewals go? Or maybe shorter in, in nature than, than they've historically been. Uh, you know, Lucas, as I said before, I mean, we're we're not, you know, we we've we're not going to comment on our contract discussions with our customers, and and we're not going to to speculate. So, um, uh, I I really can't I can't help you more than that. Okay. No, that's 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 appreciated. Um, on on the Granite City side. Uh, could, could you maybe update us on, on kind of what the what the most recent um, uh, update is in terms of uh, in terms of your conversations with U.S. Steel? Obviously, uh, we, we're all following the news, and 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 seems tricky, but but would appreciate your your color on on, on where that where that project stands today. Sure. Well, with respect to the GPI project, uh, we are continuing to work with U.S. Steel on the GPI project. We are doing the detailed engineering for what would be a first-of-its-kind project uh, right now. Um, and so we'll continue to work with G U.S. Steel on the GPI project, and we would look forward to working with Nippon in the future. Got it. A any, any sort of timing when that detailed engineering might be completed? Uh, that's an ongoing project with U.S. Steel, and I'm not going to comment further on it. Okay. Okay. And 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 uh, order of magnitude, if um, what, what sort of capital might we be looking at? Uh, I assume there are costs for a conversion. Uh, so so I I'd be curious about kind of the, the cash component, but then also. Um, any sort of reclamation liabilities that might be assumed would, would be very helpful to understand uh, what, what the capital commitments might be. Thank you. 
hey, look, yeah, this is Shantanu. I mean, as we have said before, right, I mean, obviously, kind of as we, when we, you know, announced this project, we said, like, you know, based on at that point of time, the project was kind of uh, assumed, and that's how we are pro progressing right now, is it's going to, you know, be a, thinking about from a cash CapEx perspective, it's two years of our free cash flows, plus some revolver borrowing, right? And that still is the case as we move forward with this project. So we haven't really given out uh, cap, like, you know, specific number, but that's kind of the order of magnitude is roughly, you can think about it, just two years of our free cash flows plus some revolver borrowing. That is very helpful. I, I appreciate all the color. I'll, I'll turn it over for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lucas. Thank you. As a reminder, everyone, if you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypad. The next question is from Nathan Martin with Benchmark. Your line is open. Thanks, operator. Good morning, everyone. Uh, congrats on the first quarter results. And uh, Mike, congratulations on your retirement. Best of luck there. Much appreciated. Thanks. Um, maybe. Moving over to logistics segment for a second, multi-year highs, uh, tons handled there. I think that's mainly, you know, logistics X, CMT, as you guys mentioned in your prepared remarks, a lot of that was driven by increased shipments due to the uh, outage at Baltimore. Uh, you know, no update to your logistics volume guidance, it didn't look like. So is the expectation that tons kind of come down in subsequent quarters as Baltimore reopens, or is there a possibility you exceed uh, that original guidance if, if current levels kind of remain elevated? Thanks, Nathan. I mean, you know, yeah, as we said, you know, Q1 from a domestic terminal perspective was one of the was the best quarter in the last five years, right? So it was definitely an exceptional quarter. Um, as as we have seen, right, like you saw the last year. The, the logistics business could be quite volatile, right? So, I mean, as we sit here today, what we're looking at the market, we are affirming our guidance, you know, if the market kind of remain up and down and in weak, uh, that's what we expect. But if, if, you know, we see a pickup in the uh, out year, uh, uh, you know, later half of the year, there we, we, can, we can pick up more volumes and you will see that in the results. But as we sit here today, what we are seeing, uh, we confirm our guidance and we, we stick with the 30 to $35 million of logistics EBITDA. I appreciate that, Shantanu. I guess just, just thinking, you know, the Baltimore port looks like the main deep draft terminal is not scheduled or targeted to be reopened until the end of May. It, it would just make some sense. Maybe do you still think you'll have some benefit here in the second quarter? Not not much. I mean, you know, we, we saw kind of some pickup you know, at the start, like when it happened, and then we saw some in Q2, but it's really not driving the results that much as we sit here today. Okay, that's fair. And then maybe specifically at CMT, you guys talked about, you know, the weak commodity markets, weak coal exports. Um, just curious, did you hit your coal take or pay minimum during the first quarter from a volume perspective? Maybe remind us, is that looked at on a quarterly basis? or is that annual? Because I think it's 4 million tons annually. Uh, and then we'll great just get your thoughts on how you view export coal demand you know, here over the next few quarters. And uh, you know how do you expect your API2 price adjustment to trend? And maybe if we use this first quarter result as a, as a baseline. Yeah, so on the take or pay, it's an annual take or pay, Nathan. So, I mean, um, obviously we, you know, you can see we don't provide like kind of Whole uh, tons separately. The total CMT did 1.8 million tons, uh, which is kind of pretty much in line and what what kind of our expectation was. And we do expect to hit the take or pay minimum uh, for for the full year for this year. Uh, again, you know, uh, going back to kind of what the expectation for for the volumes and 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 the price of the API two is. I mean, if you look at the futures, API do look pretty decent, right? I mean, um, it's it's kind of come back from the lows, but it can move pretty quickly as we have seen in the past, right? Like kind of it can move 10, 20, 30 bucks in, in a matter of a couple of days. And and th there is some, uh, our profitability, is, as, as you know, is derived from that. So it's hard to predict, right? 
Uh, what we have put in the guidance, I think we feel pretty good about it. Uh, the long run outlook of the CMT uh, terminal remains pretty attractive, and and that's why you know we we, we really like having this terminal. And and as 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 in the past, it has performed really well, and and we continue to believe in this terminal. Thanks for that, Shantanu. Um, maybe just shifting over to the domestic Coke segment real quickly. Uh, EBITDA per ton looks like uh, came in above your full year guidance range. Maybe can you talk about the, the drivers behind that outperformance? Um, so, you know, Q1 normally is one of the quarters where we don't have a lot of outages. Uh, we are just coming out of the winter, uh, just trying to, you know, kind of get back our facility to run really well in Q2 and Q3. And this this quarter, except the first, you know, first couple of weeks of January, the weather weather was pretty good as well, and it helped us kind of, you know, perform really well. On top of that, we talk about, you know, kind of higher blast spoke sales volume uh, in Q1, and that is that is actually uh, timing of that, and and that is uh, the the spot blast spoke sales volume timing where it was unusually front um, front loaded in Q1 versus the previous year. So that helped um, uh, our Q1 uh, to, to be really, really good in terms of domestic book performance. For the rest of the year, I think as, as we uh, reaffirm our Coke dom Coke domestic Coke EBITDA guidance of 238 to 248, it kind of tells you that we, we expect to run kind of as expected uh, as we announced uh, when we came about our guidance initially, and we, we kind of uh, are, are on, tack, on track to meet that guidance. Okay, I appreciate that, color. Just to make sure I, I followed correctly, you said the spot last Coke sales volumes were kind of front loaded, so more in the first quarter than, than maybe typical. So if that's true, how do, how do we think about maybe the mix, the sales mix in 2Q, 3Q, 4Q? Again, as you allude to, the adjusted EBITDA per ton is going to need to, to come down, obviously, just to get you within your, your full year guidance. But is there is there any kind of uh, additional plan maintenance in any given quarter you know, that could pressure EBITDA per ton maybe in 3Q or 4Q, just for instance? or you know, any sales mix or headwind, tailwind we, sh we should be thinking about? No, I mean, uh, the, 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 there's obviously, as I mentioned, there was no outages in Q1, so we expect to have outages in, you know, not expect, we have planned outages in Q3 and Q4 of the year, right? So that'll impact our performance during that time. And, you know, kind of from our contracted sales perspective, it's kind of, kind of pretty ratably laid out. And then spot coke, uh, if first quarter was heavily loaded, obviously, like you know, you know, the rest of the year would kind of um, even out based on that. As we said, you know, uh, we have 650,000 equivalent uh, blast and foundry coke sales, coke tons to sell, and that just laid out for the year. It just heavily loaded in the front first quarter, so it's going to be lower in the rest half of the year. Got it. I uh, appreciate those comments. I'll leave it there. Best of luck uh, in the second quarter. Thank you. Thank you. We have a follow-up question with Lucas Pipes with B Riding Securities. Your line is open. Thank you so much, operator. Thank you so much for taking my follow-up question. Um, I, I wondered if you could maybe give us a little bit of an update on to kind of the size of the North American blast furnace coke market. Um, uh, there, there's been the idling at Granite City. Um, there have been some other changes on the utilization rate of, of the blast furnace fleet. Obviously, there are changes if you look out in the years ahead, as we discussed earlier. But uh, kind of what's the status quo? Uh, where would you put the, the size of the market today? Thank you. Uh, Lucas, I mean, apart from the Granite City idling, you know, uh, things haven't really changed that much in the North American market, right? I mean, there is obviously a lot of announced um, EAF capacity coming online uh, in the future in two, three, four years. But as we sit here today and, you know, you kind of think about versus the last two, three years, Apart from the 
Granite City uh, blast furnace shut down, the, the utilization or the coke demand hasn't changed um, as a whole in the North America. Okay, okay, so, so what's, the, what's the market size roughly? Uh, it's, it's roughly, you know, kind of as we have said in our uh, earnings deck, uh, it, it's around, you know, eight and a half to 10 million tons of coke, coke what is kind of being produced in the, in the U.S., uh, in the North American market. Got it. So this would include uh, uh, Algoma and Tefasco and Stelco up in, up in Canada? Correct. Correct. Um, and so, so kind of fair to say you have, what, kind of 50, 40 percent of the market today? Uh, we, we say we have roughly 30, 35 to 40 percent of the market. Because, because we only sell 3.6 million tons of contracted capacity, right? Got it. Yeah, and then, but then you sell some other blast furnace coke in North America as well, right, on a, on a spot basis? Yes, it's North America and all over the world, yeah. And then foundry as well, right? Yep. Which we are not yep. including so in that, right? Yeah, so the so the thirty to thirty five percent would just be your contracted volumes. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, do you have a what? What is the competition on the merchant coke side? Uh, kind of the next closest merchant coke supplier. How large would they be? Uh, I mean, this is also again. As we discussed, the only other merchant coke producer in the U.S. is DTE, um, and you know their capacity is in the like 800,000 to a million ton range. Got it. Um, and they don't have a um, they don't have a byproduct of an asset, right? They do have byproduct. They they have the traditional coke production coke met coke production methodology. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, that 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 makes sense. So so kind of the 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 if I if I just kind of look at this high level, um, integrated capacity still around fifty percent. Is that about right? Yeah, a little more than fifty percent, I would say. Yep. And how would you describe that fleet? Has it been generally well maintained or or do you have a view on, on, on that capacity? Uh, I mean, as, as, as you know, kind of, you know, the Coke plans that have shut down recently, right? So obviously there hasn't been much capital spent on that. Uh, which, what, which are the ones that shut down? Coke facilities? The recent announcement was uh, uh, the Clariton, right? The, the two batteries that shut down. Uh, what was their utilization rate prior to that shutdown? Well, Lucas, for that, I guess, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you, you got <laughs> we don't follow that that closely, or, you know, you got to ask USTL for that. Okay. Um, I'll have to follow up with them. Um, okay, that's, that's helpful. But, but um, it, it, your view is that you, you can compete effectively. Um, with that integrated capacity and, and kind of take share from there? Yeah, I mean, if you look at last three years, right, like what we have done since coming out of COVID, right, we have maneuvered the market really well. It, the market has been constantly changing, as we have talked about, and we have been able to run full uh, and kind of, you know, run really profitably. And we continue to believe that we, we, we will be able to do that uh, in the future. Okay. Um, in, in terms of uh, kind of your, your, your spot Coke uh, sales today, have there been increased opportunities due to customer outages in terms of the spot blast furnace Coke market in North America? L Lucas, on the, you know, kind of, we, we don't talk about spot blast furnace Coke separately. We always talk about spot blast and foundry Coke on a combined basis, given the size of the market. And that spot, 
hasn't changed. That's the 650,000 equivalent blast furnace scope that you sell, and we intend to sell in 23, uh, 24. Okay. Um, all right. I, I really appreciate the additional color. Um, thanks, thanks so much for taking my follow-up question, and uh, that, that's what's left. Thank you. Thank you. We currently have no further questions, so I will hand back over to Catherine to conclude. Thank you all again for joining us this morning and for your continued interest in Sun Coke. Let's continue to work safely and create value for all of our stakeholders. Thank you. This concludes today's call. Thank you for joining. You may now disconnect your line.